This is Bob Academy. We continue our study in the Psalms series. Today we are still in Psalm 78 and we'll be doing uh, part two. We begin in verse 32. Now before we get started, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins. At the same time, we want to allow the Spirit of God to control us. Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the opportunity, the time, the freedom that we have to study your word. We ask now that our hearts and minds be open and ready to hear it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me do a short review here of what we saw in our last lesson. Asaph wrote this psalm to teach the Israelites to learn from the history of Israel about the importance of obedience to the commandments of God and living by faith. We were in the third part of the outline. Let's look at that again. The psalmist traces through the history of Israel the wondrous works of God that they forgot before they rebelled and sinned. Now just to Brief reminder of what we've studied so far. I'm not going to read the psalm. There's 31 verses that we studied last time, but let me just remind you. In verses 1 through 7, we saw Asaph, Asaph command the people to listen to the instructions and stories passed down from their fathers so they could set their hope in God and not forget the works of God and not become like their stubborn, rebellious, unstable, and unfaithful forefathers of the Exodus generation. Then we saw in verses 9 through 11 where Asaph recalls the failure of the Ephraimites through lack of trusting God and fled away in battle, and they lost the ark over to the Philistines. And then what we saw in our last uh, section, the part three so far, 12 through 31 of the verses we saw in the account of the Exodus generation, how even after the Lord delivered them from Egypt, them witnessing the plagues, their miraculous escape through the sea, they continued to lack faith when it came to God's provision for water and food in the wilderness. For this, they were punished and many died. And we're about halfway through that story. Uh, <clears throat> when we finish today, we will be through the plagues. And then we'll be getting ready to go into the desert, probably in our last lesson, or if I extend it into a, another lesson after that. So we are uh, in the section on the uh, plagues. And that's where we go now, not quite halfway through this story. Well, we ended last time looking at their dying because they craved the meat, and for that they suffered with a plague. So the story does kind of jump around here. It doesn't stay in chronological order, but the point is to learn the lessons, okay? And one of the points we should have learned there is that even when you get what you want without faith, it can become your downfall. An important lesson. Verse 32. In spite of all of this, they still sinned and did not believe in his wonderful works. After all the provision, after the plagues, after the deliverance of the Red Sea, they still not did not believe after they saw God work in their life so many times. Even with their bellies full with this miraculous meat, food in their mouth, they refuse to believe in God. Now, that says something about the term believing. What does that mean sometimes? People, I think, take it too lightly. They don't see the importance of it and how deep it really is, the commitment that's involved. Believing includes giving oneself over to God, just not acknowledging there is a God. It's obeying the God that you believe in. 
it's the package of understanding that when we exercise faith, we are trusting a person. And in trusting a person, we commit to follow him. That's what it means to believe in Christ. So to not follow through with their faith shows that they did not want a genuine relationship to him. They loved their sin more. Many people will say they believe in God. Even the demons do that. But those same people who say they believe in God want nothing to do personally with God because they might have to change their lifestyle. They might actually have to begin to live holy. Verse 33. So he caused them to finish their days in vanity and their years in terror. This is an interesting ending. To finish their days in vanity and their years in terror is to say their lives were empty. A meaningless life. That's your vanity. Life without God is meaningless. Not even real life. Or we might say real living. And terror has the idea of, well, they went from one tragedy to another. Disease, famine, war, loss of a loved one, withering away in death and health. A life full of fears. Many people have said if they could just see a miracle, they would believe. Probably not. Why? Because the heart is the issue. God has provided substantial proof of his existence. Creation itself just doesn't come out of nothing. The design of creation shows intelligence. We see in his works a design of creation that indicates we live under something much, much greater than us. We call him God. You see, they have to want to know God. They have the faith. It's a matter of exercising it towards God. If they want to know God, they just have to turn to him and believe. But you see, as long as they're not turned, We call that repentance. If they want to live in sin and for sin and for the devil and for the world, they won't believe. They have to deliberately choose, every person does, to turn from sin, Satan, the world, ourself, and turn to God and his son and believe. It's a matter of choice. Verses 34 through 37 tell us how they temporarily temporarily lived by faith, but were not steadfast. They were inconsistent. So their response was a momentary response to get them out from under the severe discipline. We'll look at two verses first, the first two. So they're under discipline. When he killed them, they sought him. They repented and sought God earnestly. Notice the positive response. And they remembered that God was their rock, the most high God, their redeemer. That's all very good. All this is good. They described the right thing to do. They repented. They turned from sin back to God. They sought him earnestly. And that's good too. They also, as we see, remembered that God was their rock, their place of safety, their stability. They even dress him as the most high God. Remember Elyon? the supreme God over everything, the Redeemer, the one who delivered them. Now, this is all good. We'd probably say, well, that person's a believer. But there's a fatal flaw. It starts to come out in verse 36 and 37. But they flattered him with their tongues and lied to him with their tongues, excuse me, flattered him with their mouths and lied to him with their tongues. Their heart was not steadfast toward him. They were not faithful to his covenant. Let's look at the heart in verse 37. The heart was not steadfast. This tells us there was no consistency in their faith. And they show that in the second line by not being faithful to the covenant. 
So what happens is, as soon as they see themselves delivered, they go back to their sinful way of life, indicated by their flattering God, rather than truly praising him, and lying to him with their tongues. And it was disingenuous in their praise or pretending to praise. We might be even more accurate calling it, they pretended, they played the game. It's like a lot of people go to church today, they play the game. Now let's look at the pattern, what we've seen. If we go back a little earlier in some of these earlier verses, they were, they were being killed. So under pain, distress, and severe discipline, they repent. They seek God earnestly. And that's what you want, like I said. They remember God was their rock, their place of stability and safety, and that's good too, all right? That's all good. But then, once they thought they were safe and on solid ground, you know, after all, we're saved. We're back with God. But now we're going to start playing the game again. And that starts to reveal how twisted their thinking was. So they start to flatter God rather than have a genuine, genuine response of praise. And this is a good uh, reminder, you might even say a good connection to what we learn and Jesus, with Jesus telling the parable of the soils. Okay, In the parable of the soils, it is like the seed, which represents the word of God, that fell on the rocky soil. Well, that shallow, thin soil. It's described as believing for a while. So it believes for a short time, but never grows a root and falls away. This is the short-term believer that shows no consistent and serious interest in spiritual growth. It's like some people who believe just to escape hell. You see, this believer may respond in the fear of death, repents, and even rejoices over his fire escape, but never stays with his faith for it to take hold. Churches are full of these type of people. Churches uh, cater to them to please their appetite for entertainment and fun. There's no serious Bible teaching where people can grow in their faith and take root. They're never told, even as Christians, to repent again. See, that's been done. You're saved. Some will preach once saved, always saved. So basically, that means you have a security no matter what you do afterwards. Folks, there's no truth to that. Now, a lot of people don't get serious Bible teaching because they don't want it. So they end up getting the pastors they want. I've seen that too many times personally, too. The church they want, they want it to stay shallow, traditional, everybody get along, no one being challenged by the truth. And they want to live their lightweight faith. After the Sunday service, they'll go back to their sinful patterns. If you look at verse 37 a little closer again, it, clarif it clarifies the reason for this shallowness. Their heart was not steadfast toward him. The heart is where you live your life from. Your thinking, your conscience, your value system, your volition. The place from which you believe and make choices. Steadfast, let me just show that to you for a moment. The word is kun. Now think about this when I show this to you on the board. Broaden your understanding of it. The nifal, the passive voice, uh, it means to be set up, established, and fixed. So they're, they were not fixed towards God. They were not set up or established toward God. In other words, they were shaky, unsteady in their consistency. Add to that the second half. They were not faithful to his covenant. They revealed their lack of steadfastness by not living consistently 
the life under the covenant they were called to live. So this tells us who they really are. That's why they flatter with their mouths and lies with their tongues, even to God. They're hypocrites. They're phonies. They play the game. But now and then, playing that game catches up to them, and they get clobbered. Today, the Christians die of the sin and of death. They'll come under such severe discipline, some will actually turn back. Or if they stay in that path of rebellion, they can fall away from their faith and even die spiritually. And that does mean lose their salvation. It's like the soil where the word never takes root and falls away. Now understand, folks, look at these words. They repented and sought God earnestly. That's what we want people to do, even today, to be saved. And then believe in Jesus. Once you hear the gospel, you believe in Jesus. Of course, back in there, in those days, they didn't know about Jesus like we do. So their direction of their faith was towards God in his word and what he said about um, the coming of a Savior in the future through the uh, sacrifices and rituals and the prophets and so on. But once Christ comes on the scene, he's, he, he dies, he's buried, he's resurrected, Christ becomes our major object, object of faith, uh, along with God, of course. We've got to believe in God to believe in Christ, obviously. So Christ is our object today. And they went as far as they basically could. But what happens is, once they get in the system and fall under the covenant, they become unfaithful to it. And that shows they're not living by faith anymore. And they've fallen away. Now we turn to God in verses 38 and 39. Why does God put up with these people? Why does he put up with us? In spite of their shallowness and lack of seriousness, God is still who he is. Verse 38. Yet he, being compassionate, atoned for their iniquity and did not destroy them. He restrained his anger often and did not stir up all his wrath. Folks, this is why you don't get clobbered for your sin. Okay? Now then you get some discipline if you don't confess timely. But you have a God who is wonderful. He's compassionate, and he understands you. Look at verse 39. Let's read that also. Let me just broaden this a little bit. He remembered they were flesh, that they were flesh, a wind that passes and does not return. God knows you're human. Doesn't excuse your sin. But God expects it. That doesn't mean he wants you to do it or approves of it or that you can't choose against it. But God knows man. You know man. You know yourself. Let's break this down a little bit. Yet he, being compassionate, atoned for their iniquity. In other words, he forgave their sin. After all, they did turn back. Why does he do that? Because he's compassionate. The way it's put, being compassionate, atone for their iniquity. Listen, now this is something a lot of people don't understand. And it's very important for you to understand this. If you truly repent, you do something really bad. You know it was rotten. You lied to cover it, da 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 whatever. And you truly repent and go to God, tell him that sin. And you mean it in your heart. You tell God you did it. God will forgive you, no matter how bad it was. That's who he is. He can discipline, and he often does. But he also can stop the discipline, turn his wrath away. And that's what we have in the second part of this verse. And do not destroy them. And did not destroy them, excuse me and did not destroy them. 
He restrained his anger often and did not stir up all his wrath. A little discipline here and there, but he didn't kill them all. You see, it's up to us. What are we going to do after we sin? If you are going to stay consistent and live the obedient life, you have to regularly confess your sin. Don't kid anybody. You're a sinner. Read 1 John 1 again. Anybody that says he doesn't sin is a liar. Of course you're going to sin. That's one of the great things about God. He gives us 1 John 1, 9 to get back right with him. Simple process taught in the New Testament, but it's also taught in other words throughout the Old Testament. You need to repent of your sin. One of the reasons God is compassionate, now listen to this, this is the verse 39. And we must have that compassion to survive because we are of the flesh. We are imperfect creatures who carry a sinful nature. A natural tendency, sinful tendency, that tempts us to sin. We are all weak, and we are inconsistent. Now, we can grow out of that if we choose to do so and grow spiritually. Back to the parable of the soils. This is a soil, soil that takes root, staves off the distractions of pleasures and worry, and produces good fruit. Notice also the second line to verse 39. A wind that passes and does not return. That tells you how short your life is. I used to describe it as uh, a life is like a puff of smoke. You ever seen anybody blow out some smoke from a pipe or a cigar? It's there just a just a less than a minute before it's gone. That's the way our life is. So here we are, a very short time on earth. And we're tainted by the sinful nature. Our resistance is weak. And today, even with the spirits indwelling, we can still choose to turn away from the spirit, give in to the sinful nature and the temptation, and sin and sin and sin. Then we get the discipline. We repent. That is, we repent, we turn from sin, confess to God, and get right with him again. That's a family relationship. You see, we are saved. We're part of God's family. And as such, he has set it up so we can keep walking with him as long as we keep confessing our sins. I'm going to show these words if you haven't seen them for a while. It's always a good reminder. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, that means name them, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you confess your sin, you're admitting that that was a sin and you're turning from it. That's assumed. Okay? But notice, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We're back with him again. We're living the holy life. And if you make this a habit and use it properly, we grow spiritually. And as you grow spiritually, you will sin, but sin less and become more mature spiritually. But you see, each of us has to choose this and do it consistently. And we also have the Holy Spirit, as mentioned a moment ago, to strengthen us, to stay with God, to resist sin. But we have to choose also for him to rule us. You learned that in Romans 6. He, we have to let the Holy Spirit rule us. That's a constant decision as well. Now, in verses 40 through 43, Asaph begins to review what we saw earlier in this psalm. We go back to Egypt and the wilderness. So this is something that the Israelites need to remember. It was a big deal. After all, it betrayed uh, initial salvation being redeemed and then trying to live the Christian life during their life through the wilderness on into the promised land, which is, of course, represents heaven. You're going to be struggling. You're going to sin. You're going to fall away. Some will stay faithful. 
as did Joshua. All right, here we go, verse 40. So we go back to Egypt and then the wilderness. How often they rebelled against him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. Let's get this a little larger here. Okay, let's start over. How often they rebelled against him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. They returned and again tested God and provoked the Holy One of Israel. They did not remember his power or the day when he redeemed them from the enemy, when he performed his signs in Egypt and his judgments in the field of Zoan. All right, we'll just stop there. Let's break this down a little bit. The word grieve, the word grieve, astab. Astab means to cause pain or hurt. Put it on the board here. It was an offense against God, against the character of God. Verse 41 goes on to say, they returned and again tested God. So they kept testing God. They did it again and again. Note how many times and ways they tested God. 40 through 41, notice. Uh, we get a good start here with grieving him in the desert. They provoked him. All right. Let's start from the top. They rebelled. All right, they grieved him. They tested him again and again. They provoked him. Notice the Holy One, the one set apart. And then we see they did not remember his power or the day when he redeemed them from the enemy. That's all the way down to verse 42. So these are the ways they kept rebelling against God. Verse 42 tells us they did not remember his power, his redemption, his signs and judgments. That goes into verse 43. When he performed his signs in Egypt and his judgments in the field of Zoan. They forgot the redemption? Are you kidding me? They forgot the day they were delivered from Egypt and they went down to that sea and watched it divide and then pass through it? only to close after them on the Egyptians pursuing? How can you forget that? I'll tell you how. Well, we got other things to do. We got more important things to think about. I have something I really been trying to do for a long time. I gotta work. I'm too tired. I don't feel like it. How many excuses people use to not stay consistent? And then over time, with this kind of sin nature control over their hearts, they begin to forget the wonderful things that God has done. It's one reason, folks, we do communion regularly, to remind us, takes us back, takes us back to Christ, who he was and what he did. Not only his body being tortured, suffering on the cross physically, but his blood representing his spiritual death, his separation from God while he received the penalty of our sins. We are to be reminded of that regularly and we should never forget it. <clears throat> One of the commands that Jesus gave us to be passed on and do regularly. You see, the people were forgetting what God had done. Listen to one of the early commands in Exodus. Exodus 3.15. God speaks to Moses. I'll put it on the board. God also said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel. The Lord, the God of your fathers, notice the list, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is Moses talking. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. So, what he's saying is that God sent me to you, and this is what you're supposed to remember about the Lord. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered through all generations. So Moses relays the message from the Lord to the people, that the people are to remember 
him through all generations. How can anyone forget those miraculous events in their lives? And just recently, God expected them to remember his name throughout all generations. Picture yourself in the sandals of that Exodus generation for a moment. Let's say you're 50 years old. You've been a slave since you were, you were a kid. You finally get out of Egypt, even with some wealth, because uh, they turned over a bunch of their valuables to you, and you're on your way out of Egypt. Don't know for sure where you're going, but you know God's leading you. And there you are, you get to the Red Sea, and you think, or the, the sea right in front of you, which you can't cross, and the Egyptians, you find out, are in pursuit. You watch Moses. He calls upon God, and he opens up through God's power, you might say. We know that God did it. But he says that God delivers them. God is going to deliver them. Watch the, watch the deliverance of the, of the Lord. Sure enough, it opens up. And you pass through. And you get to the other side. You're rescued. Especially when you see that water come back in its place. You know the Egyptians can't pursue you. And many of them died right there with their horses and chariots. And now you're on your way to the promised land. All's good. You find yourself in the desert a little while after a while and you're thirsty. God miraculously provides water through a rock. Comes out of nowhere, more or less. Uh, you have no food. You find yourself waking up in the morning and there's food out on the ground. You gather it for a day's supply. Then it happens again the next day and the next day and the next day. It goes on for years. How can you forget that? This Exodus generation was like lazy, neglectful, irresponsible children. Let's say it's the son. Children are forget to are quick to forget what the parents do for them, how they sacrifice for them, and take care of them. Once you become adult and you can remember those things, you begin to realize how great your parents were for you. Uh, my father died when I was 10. My mother raised two boys, uh, basically until we both went off to college by herself, working a crummy job, minimum wage. Godly children should respond in kind and taking care of their parents. The Bible teaches that. Now, the experiences of the Exodus generation were unique. No other group of Israelites experienced this level and this many miracles in their lifetime. Yet so many, the vast majority, would die in the desert and never live to pass to the promised land. And what we are to learn from this is why. Because they failed to be obedient, remember what God had done for them, and not live by faith. They failed to be obedient, not remember what God did for them, and then live by faith. In verse 44, Asaph begins a long list, not real long, of some of the miracles that he's been talking about. Now, not all these plagues are listed. Only the first and the last are in order, and the, we just got a few in between. Let's go through them. Verse 44, he turned their rivers to blood so that they could not drink of their streams. There is the uh, people of Egypt. This is the first plague, by the way. You probably know that. Let's read through one of the scriptures in that passage. Exodus 7, 19. And the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over their rivers, their canals, and, uh, their, and their ponds, and all their pools of water, so that they may become blood. 
And there they shall be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, even in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone. Even the containers they had of water were blood. That's bad. Where do they get water to drink? You know, they say uh, five days, I think, is the maximum pe a, a person even in has been hydrated to live without water. You just can't live without water. Verse 45, he sent among them swarms of flies which devoured them and frogs which destroyed them. Well, this is the fourth and the second plague. From the fourth plague in Exodus 8.24 regarding the flies. And the Lord did so. There came great swarms of flies into the house of Pharaoh and, to, and into his servants' houses. No one uh, did skip anybody there in Egypt. Throughout all the land of Egypt, the land was ruined by the swarms of flies. So that's the idea of devour. Second plague regarding the locusts. This is from uh, Exodus 8, 3, and 4. The Nile shall swarm with frogs that come up into your house and to your bedroom. Wouldn't that be nice? And on your bed, going to get intimate, <laughs> and into the houses of your servants and your people, and into your ovens and your kneading bowls, even in your food, your, your cooking places. The frogs shall come up on you and on your people and on all your servants. So they're on the people too. You, just, you can just see the, the screaming and the hollering and they're and the trying to knock them off and get away from them and so on and so on. Verse 46, he gave their crops to the locusts and the fruit of their labor to the locusts. So this would probably include not only what they'd already har har harvested, but also the crops themselves. This is the eighth plague. Exodus 10, 4 through 6. Let's just read this portion. For if you refuse to let my people go beyond tomorrow, I will bring locusts into your country and they shall cover the face of the land so that no one can see the land. You can't even see the land. It's covered with locusts. And they shall eat what is left to you after the hail. This is after the hail uh, plague. And they shall eat every tree of yours that grows in the field. Every tree. And they shall fill your houses and the houses of all your servants and of all the Egyptians, as neither your fathers nor your grandfathers have seen from the day they came on earth to this day. You see, they've had locusts before but nothing comparable to this. Now we actually go to the hail. That's in verse 47. He destroyed their vines with hail and their sycamores with sleet. That's an interesting one. Mention the sycamores. Uh, let's go on to 48. And he gave over their cattle to the hail and their flock to thunderbolts because this is really the same plague. That's why I want to do those together. The word for sleet, we do not know what that means exactly. You'll see different translations of it. There's only one time it's used in the Bible, and that's here. And we don't see it used somewhere else. We don't have another context to try to figure out what it means. Okay. Uh, let me just show you the word. Tanamel. It's only used, as I said, in this passage. And you'll see it translated torrents of rain or frost from... You see that from the Septuagint. I translated it sleet. I figured it's probably some kind of hail. All right, or just maybe heavy sleet. From the seventh plague, let's read this. This is a pretty big one, so I'm going to have to move the space up a little bigger. From the seventh plague, we're going to look at several verses here. Get a little more context. I want you to see the verse 26 too. All right, so we're looking at verses 47 and 48. And the verses, we're going to look at Exodus 9, 22 through 26. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward heaven so that there may be hell in all the land of Egypt 
on man and beast and every plant of the field in the land of Egypt. Then Moses stretched out his staff toward heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail and fire, probably lightning, down to the earth. And the Lord rained hail upon the land of Egypt. There was hail and fire flashing continually in, continually in the midst of the hail, very heavy hail, such as had never been in the land of Egypt since it became a nation. The hail struck down everything that was in the field in all the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And the hail struck down every plant of the field and broke every tree of the field. Only in the land of Goshen, remember that, that's Zoan, where the people of Israel were, was there no hail. Good lesson to remember, especially during the age of tribulation. When those 100 pound hell balls start falling. Okay. Uh, so that's the seventh plague. So this lightning would be killing the livestock and the people during the hailstorm. It's a tough one. Notice verse 48 again. He gave over the, their cattle to the hail and their flocks to the thunderbolts. Okay. Verse 49, he let loose on them his burning anger, wrath, indignation, and distress, a band of destructive messengers. Notice how these expressions of God's uh, displeasure, to put it a nice way, his anger, his wrath, his indignation, and distress, they're called a band of destructive messengers. That's a difficult passage to uh, translate. Uh, the word band is also the idea of uh, a group, something like that. But what this amounts to, if you put all the words together, uh, one way to say is uh, some, some actually translate as angels, something like death angels or something like that could be translated that, may mean that, but otherwise uh, I would say it was these different ways in which God expressed his anger, a band of destructive messengers, but you get the point. As God's servants, these angels are messengers, you might say, brought on the weather disasters to be destructive and target Egyptians and their livestock. So much for... Uh, climate change. God controls the weather, folks. Period. Over and out. Verse 50. He made a path for his anger. He did not spare them from death, but gave their lives over the plague. He struck down every firstborn in Egypt, firstborn in Egypt, the first fruits of their strength in the tents of Ham. Firstborn was very important, especially to the Egyptians. Um, it had to do with them passing on the, especially to the, the Pharaoh, it had to do with passing on his, uh, as a god, for one thing, it's a little, uh, sounds a little confusing to us, but basically it's the idea that God was passing on the rule of their god in Egypt from one generation to the next, and then uh, firstborn was also the one who got the inheritance, so it's important to families as well. Uh, notice the first fruits of their strength and tents of Ham. Ham, as you probably know, was one of the sons of Noah, who was delivered through the flood. Egypt was the name of one of the sons of Ham, Genesis 10.6. So Egypt actually also has a name of Ham. You'll see it a few times in Scripture. Uh, we see it here in parallel. The tents of Ham is basically the place of Egypt. Uh, also Psalm 105, 23 and 27 and 106, 22. Egypt is the land of Ham. So this is the 10th plague. Let's read something about that one. From Exodus 11, 4 through 6. So Moses said, Thus says the Lord, about midnight I will go out in the midst of Egypt. And every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne. 
even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the hand mill, and all the firstborn of the cattle. There should be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there has never been, there ever will be again. Now what is fascinating about this one, and you probably know the history if you put it together here, uh, that this is where we get the Passover because the uh, Israelites were instructed to take the uh, lamb's blood and basically paint their doorpost. So when the death angel passed over, they would pass over that particular family, whoever's in that room or house. Well, that's the plagues. And next, as we continue on our psalm, we will go into the wilderness. And we'll do that in verse 52, starting next time. Let's pray. Oh, Father, again, we are reminded of your power, your compassion, and your love for us. And how even though you were compassionate upon us fleshly beings, you have given us a choice to believe in you, to trust you, live by faith, and be obedient. Thank you that you have made all that provision so we can grow spiritually and serve you our lifetimes. In Jesus' name, amen.